All right, so section 5.3, we're going to be multiplying decimals and then using a little bit of application and talking about the circumference of a circle. So how do we handle multiplying decimals? Just like normal, as if they're whole numbers, and then we deal with putting the decimal point back in the end. So what happens? Very first, we just want to multiply as if they're whole numbers. So just like normal. And then in the end, where does our decimal point go? Decimal point, we want to move it in the same number as the sum, so adding together, the sum of the decimal points in the factors. And it sounds hard, but it's really not. It's just an extra step on top of multiplying, we just have to count the number of decimal places or points in each of the factors, add them together, and that's the same number that we move in. So let's take an example. We want to multiply these two decimals, 23.6 times 0.78. And I'm not particular if you put a zero on the front when it is an actual small number. Um, it's good practice, but I'm not going to fault you if you don't put the zero on there. So what happens? We behave just as normal. We're going to stack them as if they're whole numbers. So we pretend that 23.6 is 236. There just happens to be a decimal point inside of there. And 0.78, we pretend like it's, it's just 78. And there happens to be a decimal. And as we're going along, let's just make note of how many decimal places in each of these factors there are. So in the first one, 23.6, if we're traveling from the right, into the decimal, how many do we actually have to move? Just one. So this is one decimal point. And then in point 0.78, again, if we start all the way on the outside of the value and travel into that decimal point, we had to travel two decimal points. Okay, so in the end, we're going to have to move in the sum of these two. So I had one and two together. We're going to have to move three decimal points in total in our final answer. So now that we have that piece taken care of, we just multiply like normal, and we can handle this. So to multiply, what happens? 8 times 6, what do we get? 6 times 8 is 48. 8 times 3, we get 24, plus another 4, we got 28. 8 times 2, we got 16, 17, 18 in total. Okay, so we took care of the 8, moving next door, now we take the 7. 7 times 6, what does that give us? 42. So write the 4 up there. 7 times 3 is 21, plus another 4 is 25. And 7 times 2 is 14, plus another 2, we get 16. So let's add those together, combine down, see what we get. Then we'll throw in our decimal point. So as we add down 8 and 0, we get 8. And I'm not sure if you can see it or not, I'll write it up there when we're done. 8 and 0 is 8. 8 and 2 is 10. Carry the 1. We've got 8 and 5 is 13. Plus another 1 is 14. Carry the 1. 6, 7, 8, and 1. So I don't know if you can see this or not, so I'm just going to write it up here. This is the value that we currently have. Got 18, 48. Okay. That was just multiplying as if they were whole numbers, though. But we were multiplying the decimals, and we have to move in three decimal places from the end of that value. So if my decimal point was here, now we're going to be traveling in one, I guess we can write it, one, two, three in. So multiplying these two, what do we get out in the end? We've got 18.408. So we behave as if they're just whole numbers, and then in the end we throw the decimal point back in. So let's take another one. And you'll be able to see it this time, all of it, hopefully. We'll take 0.0. .0 5, 3, 1, and we want to multiply by 16. So we've only got that one decimal to worry about, which is nice, but again, what happens? Behave as if they are whole numbers. They just happen to have a decimal, so we're treating this number as 531, and we're multiplying by 16. And let's just make note, have inventory of our decimal places. So in this top value, what do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4 decimal places. And then here, we don't have any, because I don't have uh, a fraction. I've got an actual whole value. So zero decimal points there. So in the end, after we've looked at our product, we're going to have to move in four decimal places. Some of those two. 
So again, let's take the 6, multiply to each. 6 times 1, we get 6. 6 times 3, we get 18. 6 times 5, we get 30, plus another 1, which is 31. 6 times 0, 0, plus 3, we get 3. Took care of the 6, so let's move on to the next digit. 1 times 1, 1. 1 times 3, 3. 1 times 5, 5. 1 times 0, 0. And we don't have to write those on there, but you can. Let's find the sum of those two, and then we'll throw in our decimal point. Adding down, 6 and 0, we get 6. 8 and 1, we got 9. 1 and 3, we got 4. 5 and 3, we've got 8. And this result is if they are whole numbers, but we've got decimals. Well, one decimal. And we have to move in how many places? 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, and to make it really evident that this is where the decimal place is, I am going to put a 0 on the front. So when we multiply these two, what did it produce? 0 0.8496. So it would be helpful as we're computing these products to have a rough idea of what we know the number is going to be around. So we could actually estimate what the product is of these decimals is going to be before it's actually computed. So we have a rough idea of what it's going to be around. So for example, what about if we want to estimate, instead of finding the exact value, we just want to know what this is going to be around. Let's estimate 28.06 times 1.95. Now we do have the skills, we could multiply those and find the exact value. But if we just kind of want like a quick and dirty version of what to expect out in this case, how could we estimate this? We're not going for the exact value, we're approximating, so we need to have our little bacon symbols. Again, this just means approximately equal to. 28.06 is really close to what? 28, so we can kind of hack off the rest of that decimal. And then 1.95 is really close to 2. So we could estimate 28 times 2, which is 56, and have a better understanding of what we should expect uh, the product of these two to be around. Might be overestimating, might be underestimating, it's just a rough value, rough estimate for us. Okay, so I've got a few for you to practice with. So go ahead and take and try these. Multiply 23.6951, multiply it by 10. And then we're going to take that same value, 23.6951, multiply by 100, and two more than that. Can we make them fit? Yeah, I'll put them over here. 23.6951 times 0 0.1, and lastly, the same value, 23.6951 times 0 0.01. So take each of those and practice the multiplication. See what you get. So in all of these cases, what's really happening? Whenever we compute these multipli uh, multiplications that are just factors of 10, all that's happening is the decimal is moving around. So as we work through them, see if we can notice any patterns. So when I multiply by 10, what's going to happen? 0 times everything is just going to be 0. So we can move on. That's going to be one digit in, one placeholder worth. And then 1 times everything is just going to produce this number. It's just scooched over a little bit. So 1 times 1, we get 5. <laughs> 1 times 1, we get 1. 1 times 5, we get 5. 1 times 9, 9, 6, 3, 2. Okay. But how many decimal points do we have to move? So in this first number, we have how many? 1, 2, 3, 4 decimal points. And in this one, we didn't have any. So in our answer, we have to move in four. So from the back, we move in one, two, three, four. So this resulted in 236.951. So when I multiplied by 10, what happened to that decimal? We took it and we moved it to the right one decimal place. So what happened? Our decimal moved one to the right. Because when I multiply by 10, Am I making the, the number larger or smaller? When I multiply something by 10, I'm making it bigger. So the decimal needs to move to make that value larger. So when I multiply by 100, then what's going to happen? That decimal is going to start here and move 2 to the right. We're going to make it a really large number. Because again, if we actually do out uh, the product itself, 0 times everything, we get 0 everywhere. 0 times everything, we get 0 everywhere. 1 times everything, we get that number back out, 
It's just moved over two digits. And again, how many do we have to move in? We've got four decimal pl places here, zero down here. So we have to move in one, two, three, four. So we multiply by 100, we've got 2,369.51. What happened? We took our decimal point, and it had to move two to the right. Because when I multiply by 100, I'm making an even larger value than when we just multiply by 10. So when we multiply by 0.1, by a fraction of a whole number, it should make it smaller. So our decimal point is going to travel in which direction? To the left now. But if you can't see it, we can still do the actual multiplication and look at the product. 1 times 1, we get 1. 1 times 5, 5, 9, 6, 3, 2. Now the fun part comes from counting the decimal places. So we've got 4 in the top and 1 down below. So in total, we're going to have to move 5 decimal places in our final value. So if we move in 5, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Started out at 23.69, and now I've got 2.36951. So what happened? We had to move our decimal, decimal, I can spell, one unit to the left. So then in this case, what happened? Take the decimal point, move it two to the left, two factors of ten, because we're multiplying by an even smaller value, which will make an even smaller number. But again, if you don't see it, actually do the product out. Still going to produce same exact number, but decimal places. How many do we have? Four up here and two down here. So in total, we have to move in six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Put a zero on the front, so it's very evident that we're dealing with a small number. So we got 0 0.236951. So our decimal point had to move... 2 to the left. Multiplying by a really small value, it's going to move it to the left, make a smaller number. Multiplying by a really large number, like 100 or 10 or 1,000, needs to move the decimal to the right, make it a lot larger. So all that's really going on is we're moving this number of decimal places is exactly the same as the number of zeros inside of our, our factor of 10. So in this case, we had one zero, so we had to move one decimal place. We had two here when we multiplied by 100, two zeros, so we had to move two decimal places. Here in this case, I've got one, one decimal place, and down here we've got two decimal places. So we had to move two to the left. So when it's a large value, we count the zeros. When it's a small value, we just count the number of decimal places. So now we should be able to quickly compute whenever we're multiplying by a factor or a multiple of 10. So, for example, if we take that same value, but in a different form, and say, well, what is 23.6951 times 1,000, then? What's going to happen? We're going to take our decimal point and move it 3 in which direction? To the right, because we're making a larger number. We've got three zeros right here, so we need to move three decimal places to the right. So, what is this going to produce? If I take that and I move it three to the right, and go one, two, three, it's going to live right here. We've got what? Twenty-three thousand six hundred ninety-five point one. Throw in a comma so it's easier to read. Okay, same story, but let's multiply by a really small number. Twenty-three point six nine five one. And we're going to multiply by zero point zero zero one. So it's a very small number, so we're not counting the actual zeros, we're counting the number of decimal places. So in this case, I've got one, two, three decimal places. So we're going to have to move three decimal places, but in which direction? We're making a smaller number, so it needs to travel to the left. So if I take that decimal point and I travel one, two, three to the left, then what happens? I have to fill this space, and what do we fill it with? Zeros. So when we multiply this guy, we're going to get out 0 0.0236951. And you could physically check it, actually stack them on top of each other, do the multiplication, count the number of decimal points. But if we can recognize the pattern, it's going to save us a lot of time. So we're going to try to move towards that and use it to our advantage. So where do we ever use this kind of math in real life or this process? 
everywhere. Our entire money system is dealing with decimals. We don't just trade and buy and sell things in terms of a whole dollar. We have change to work with. We'll look at a few examples with that in a minute, but first, let's talk about the application for the perimeter of something. We're pretty comfortable with it. We've dealt with it for a while. The first test, there was an example on there talking about perimeter. And what does it mean to be the perimeter of something? Perimeter means what? Distance all the way around. So this is distance around, but distance around a polygon. And again, what is a polygon? Some shape made with some closed shape made with straight figures. So like a rectangle, a triangle, a square, those are all polygons, straight lines connected together. So perimeter is applied to polygons, but what about the circumference of something? Circumference. So this is the same as perimeter, but it's not around a polygon, it's around a circle. So circumference just means the same thing, distance around, but instead of around a straight-sided uh, shape, we're going around a circle. Okay, I'm very visual. I have to see it drawn out, so draw yourself a nice circle. And we're going to label each of the pieces if it's been a while since you've done any kind of geometry. But our distance all the way across from end to end of the circle through the center is called the diameter. So this is D, represented with D. D is the diameter, or the distance all the way across, okay? But if we start from the center and we travel out to the side, we're not spanning the entire circle, just from the center out, half of it. This is called the radius, and we represent it with R, radius. So the diameter is the distance all the way across, the radius is just from the center out. So what is the circumference, or the distance, all the way around the circle? How do we find that? How do we find C, or the circumference? Circum, fur, oh, we had a spell. I mean, there's an F in there. There we go, circumference. So their circumference just means the distance all the way around the circle. How do we represent that? We label it C, so we don't have to keep writing that long word. Okay. It's kind of interesting where it comes from, and hopefully once I show it to you, you won't forget. I know I never did after, the f after I learned this fact. So the circumference is pi times the diameter. So what does that mean? What is pi, and again, what is the diameter? We have to break those down. So pi is an approximation of an irrational number, which means it never ends, it never repeats. We don't actually know the end of it but we know what it starts as. It's approximately 3.14159. Okay, so approximately three, if we're gonna be really crass and just cut off the rest of that value. So the circumference is approximately three times the diameter. And what is the diameter from here to there? So what this is saying is the distance all the way around the circle is approximately three times this distance. Now I'm going to grab a rag and see if this will actually span across that. Hopefully it will. Um, not a great visual, but hopefully it'll get the idea across. So what is my diameter length? It's about from here to here on my rag. So this is the diameter of the circle that I've drawn. So the circumference or the distance all the way around is going to be approximately three of these from my finger to my finger. So if I take that distance, that diameter, and start somewhere, let's wrap it around, and it should go approximately three and a little bit more times. Now my picture is not very accurate, um, but you'll get the idea. So if I start somewhere across the top, here's the start of my rag. If I travel around, okay, traveling, traveling, it's curving. Then I stop, maybe about right there. So that was my first traveling, uh, the distance of the diameter D. Now from that point, now I'm on to number two. It goes all the way around stops approximately right there. Then from here, what happens? I start there, I'm wrapping all the way around, here's my approximate distance, and then what? I've got a little bit of extra to travel, but how many times did this diameter length actually go around the circle? One, two, three, and a little bit more. 
3 and a little bit more, that value of pi. So it's just pi times the diameter. Another way to look at it then, the diameter and the radius are tied how? So if the radius is only half of this distance, if I put two of those radii together, r and another r, it'll give me all the way across the circle. So the diameter is also 2 times the radius. Because again, if this is only half of it, if I multiply by 2, then I'm looking at the whole distance. So another way to write the circumference, the circumference could also be written as pi times 2r. And the order doesn't matter with multiplication. So it might be um, a little bit more of a trigger if you hear 2 pi r written in that order. They all mean the same. They're all equivalent. Um, they're just built off of different pieces of our circle, the diameter or the radius. So let's use that fact. And we want to answer this question. We want to find the circumference of a circle whose radius, radius, is 5 inches, and we're given units, and then we want to use 3.14 to approximate pi. To approximate pi. So we'll have our exact value, just leaving pi in, and then we can actually approximate it, because in terms of length, um, it's hard to visualize what does the length pi actually look like three and a little bit longer. So we'll plug that in the end. So they gave us the radius, so we want to use this form of our circumference. They didn't give us diameter, the entire distance, they just gave us radius. But what would the diameter of this same circle be? If the radius is five inches, so from here to here is five inches, then from here to here has to be what? Double that. So this one would be five and this one would be five. Our diameter would be ten inches. So it's not so hard to figure out if they give you a different form and you maybe remember in terms of diameter instead. So let's use it. What's our circumference? Circumference is 2 times pi times my radius, which is 5. So when we multiply these, what do we get? I got 10 pi. 10 pi, but we want to approximate it because exactly how long is that? It's hard to tell. So let's use 3.14 and actually approximate this value. So it's not exact, because we're cutting off a lot of that never-ending, never-repeating digit pi. But approximately, what is it around? Circumference is approximately 10 times 3.14. And we won't have to do that math off on the side, because I'm multiplying by one factor of 10. We've got one zero on there. So this tells me to do what? Take my decimal and move it one point to the right, making it a larger value. So 31.4. But what are the units? So how many dimensions are we looking at here? We're just looking at a distance. And distance is always measured in single units. Just like uh, the perimeter of something, perimeter of a room. We could measure in feet or inches. Same story here, it's just round instead of a polygon. So in this case, what are our units? 31.4 inches around. Okay, so last problem, application in the real world. I get that question all the time. When do we ever use this map in real life? Everywhere. So specifically in this case, really applicable to us if you drive a car, you're basically doing this kind of math all the time. So if you go up to a gas station, currently as I was driving here, I think it was like 231. So let's just use that. So let's say if gas is currently two dollars, two dollars, not three, two dollars and thirty-one cents per gallon. And if you purchase eleven gallons and you buy eleven gallons, what's your total? So usually the pump does this math for you, but we should be able to do it as well. So if it's 231 per gallon and you buy 11 gallons, what is your total going to be? So how do we calculate this? Well, it's $2.31 per gallon, and we're purchasing 11 of them, so we want to multiply them together. And in this case, 231, we've got two decimal places. And then 11, we don't have any. It's a whole number. So we multiply in the end, then we're going to have to move in two decimal places. Let's do the math. 
1 times everything is going to produce those same numbers. We're going to move next door, 1 times those. Again, still going to produce exactly the same. Adding down, 1 and 0, we got 1. 3 and 1, we got 4. 2 and 3, 5 and 2. We're moving in two decimal places. So from the outside, 1, 2 in. Total in this case to fill up, $25.41. And we do have a practical application with our units, so we want to include that as well.